Well, today we're talking about two really fun names to say, Aquila and Priscilla. Cool. Husband and wife. They're tent makers and partners with Paul. So he's Chris and I'm Jeff and we're the Bible Guys. So, Jeff, this week we're doing the segment all week of Stump the Pastor. Okay. And by the way, if you're listening and you have any question that you want us to try to tackle, you can send your emails into info at, right here, uh, The Bible Guys, thebibleguys.com. These are fun. Uh, yeah, they they are fun, yeah. and so we've chosen five, or actually we haven't chosen them. They've been chosen for us and handed to us. That's right. And so today, there this this one comes from Larry P. And Larry P. says this: uh, Hebrews nine twenty seven states, "Just as a man is destined to die once, and after that to face judgment, how did Lazarus and Tabitha, whom Jesus rose from the dead, not have to die a physical death twice?" Mm. And, and again, to your point. Anybody who thinks about that are great thinkers. Mm-hmm. Yes. So taking the word, it's a point on a man wants to die. Yes. And, and after, after that, that the, judgment. the judgment. Right. So saying then Lazarus and Tabitha, they were raised from the dead. They had died. Yes. Then they were raised from the dead. So uh, Larry is saying, so then that must mean that they didn't have to die again. Right. Because right. because it says it's a point on a man wants to die. Right. 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 So there's uh, several things. Th- that's a great question by the way (laughs) it is good job knowing verses in hebrews yeah the book of hebrews has a certain amount of complexity to it there's a certain amount of depth in the kind of christian that can plow through the book of hebrews and 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 grasp it all right Mm -hmm. and so that that's fantastic which we're going to get to hebrews eventually so that that's going to be good but um good job on that larry here's what i would say the natural most of the time the bible talks from the natural position this is the natural way the world works right there's the natural thing um, whenever God chooses to do a miracle, so he set up the natural laws, the, the natural law of gravity. If you step off the roof of your house and hit the ground, that wasn't a miracle that caused you to hit the ground. That's just the natural law. The natural law is right. you fall off the roof, gravity makes you hit the ground. So the natural way is you die one time. Right. And after that is the judgment. Yeah, it's, a, it's, the princi- it's the general principle for mankind, and it's a true for everybody. That's true. When God does a miracle... That means that he ha- he goes beyond the natural. That's why it's called supernatural. God goes beyond the natural. And in those moments when he goes beyond the natural way of things, he's making an exception to the natural rule. Like Peter uh, was the only human recorded ever to defy gravity and walk on water. Except for Jesus. Except for Jesus. Well, that, that's right. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, right. Fully I guess God, Jesus fully man. was human. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, um, I should say fully human. Yes, that's right. That, <laughs> so, so he... he um, so when God intervenes in the natural oh, world, gum, it's, oh, hang on, Jesus was fully human. I know. That's yes, what I but said. he was also God. He was fully man, fully God. I know, God. I know. I just, I said the word yeah. fully human. I was just going to let you, let, let the heresy just hang out there no, for a while. No. <laughs> I know what I mean. I'm just not saying it correctly. In my mind, I know exactly yeah, what I mean. Yeah, I know, I know what you meant too. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Peter's the only other guy besides Jesus. Right. Yeah. yeah the only who wasn't one who wasn't God. God. Who there, wasn't you go. God. There, there you go. There That's you go. the perfect. way I was thinking. That was perfect. So uh, to get back to this topic, uh, because Larry is waiting at the edge of the seat <laughs> for an answer. And he's like, you two yahoos. Why did I ask these guys? You could have asked any other Bible teaching guy. Probably could have got a straight up answer. So, um, so the natural is that's natural. It's natural that we all would die one time. When God chooses to reach in and intervene in the natural, it's called supernatural. And in that moment, God is making exception to the natural world right. laws. Right. And so in this situation, when he raises Lazarus from the dead or Tabitha from the dead, there's a couple other people. Now he intervened. That was the exception to the rule. Right. But they're not here now. And there's no indication in the Bible that they were miraculously taken to heaven. There were only two people that's mentioned that way. So the assumption would be, and church history tells us, Lazarus died again. Right. Right. He died a second time. Right. So for you and me, we have a natural appointment one time. And if God chooses to, he can intervene and give you two appointments instead of one. But that's a that's an exception to the rule. So the summary would be is that uh, this verse is is a natural statement for all of mankind. Mm-hmm. And Jesus uh, made an exception, made the exception, Lazarus, Tabitha and a few other people yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, whom he raised from the dead. Yeah. Like the little girl. That's right. Right. And and. Uh, and so, yeah, that's it. So they died twice. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. great. And uh, you know what? The second time you die, I bet you're not you're not scared anymore. Anymore. You know, uh, I, th- right? I think I, was... I heard a comedian, John Christ, 
talk about, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, what a great day that Jesus rose Lazarus from the grave. Everybody, everybody standing around the grave was so happy, yeah. except for Lazarus. Yeah, he's like, what? Yeah, he's in heaven, and all of a sudden, uh, <laughs> St. Peter runs up to him and goes, uh, listen, uh, we, God wants you to do him a favor. Well, St. Peter, <laughs> Peter was on earth. Oh, dead gummits. Yeah. Well, I'm just sort of riffing off of John's yeah, jokes. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. Yeah, hey, I'm, it's I'm time all, for you to go back. It's you know, I'm a, I'm as a sign off today. Yeah, yeah. No, hey, I, I'll I'll keep you floating through this yeah, thing. Yeah, no just kidding. Stick with me, buddy. But anyway, but John yeah. Chris was talking about the fact that he was in heaven and he was notified. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right, because Saint Peter's always the guy in heaven, <laughs> yeah, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, it'd be Gabriel. Gabriel but he was, to you. So he's notified that he has to go back and leaving heaven to go back to Earth was a bad day for Peter yeah, for, yeah. for Lazarus. What? Yeah, yeah, you go from paradise back to this planet. Yeah, death and decay, disappointment, and sadness. Uh, I know my wife is at home right now, putting on her makeup, listening to the Bible guys like she always does every morning, oh. and she's thinking, "Come on, husband." Yeah, yeah, no, no, get hey, it together. No, I know what you meant. I know what you meant, and your value goes way beyond precision. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, yeah. no, we love you. So <laughs> we are in uh, we're in Acts chapter eighteen, and uh, this dynamic duo, Priscilla and Aquila, yeah. are really incredible people, and God uses both of them. Uh, in extraordinary ways in the lives of a couple of the most influential Christian leaders in early church history, Mm -hmm. right? So let's just pick up there. We're only going to read like 11 verses today, but man, it's going to be good. Then, So verse 1 in chapter 18, Then Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he became acquainted with a Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently arrived from Italy with his wife Priscilla. They had left Italy when Claudius Caesar deported all Jews from Rome. Paul lived and worked with them, for they were tent makers, just as he was. Each Sabbath found Paul at the synagogue, trying to convince the Jews and Greeks alike. And after Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul spent all his time preaching the word. He testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed and insulted him, Paul shook the dust from his clothes and said, Your blood is upon your own heads. I'm innocent, for from now on I will go and preach to the Gentiles. Then he left and went to the home of Titius Justus, a Gentile who worshiped God and lived next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, and everyone in his household believed in the Lord. Many others in Corinth also heard Paul, became believers, and were baptized. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision and told him, Don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent, for I am with you. No one will attack you and harm you, for many people in this city belong to me. So Paul stayed there for the next year and a half, teaching the word of God. So there you go. We meet... Aquila and Priscilla, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, that's the last time it's mentioned Aquila and Priscilla. From this point on, now it'll always be Priscilla and Aquila, uh, and they wind up having a huge impact. But in the meantime, this is the beginning of the church in Corinth, which winds up ha- b- being a central church for quite some time. Yeah, and uh, and also it's 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 worth noting that Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers. Yeah, and they're the ones that sort of get Paul going on making tents. Yeah, well, so it looks like Paul's a trade. It would have been traditional with Jews uh, that a boy would have grown up with a trade, even if he wound up being a scholar like Paul. Mm-hmm. So he probably was trained to be a tent maker. But in this situation, uh, they wound up connecting with each other because uh, Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers, and so was Paul. Mm. And and you'll notice Paul writes about that a few different times, where he says, "Hey, I didn't take any money from you people." Right. He was coming into these towns, and he wasn't receiving offerings for himself. He was paying his own way by, by, being, a tent by maker. being a tent maker. Yeah, yeah. and so were they. Uh, so the notes in my uh, new new life uh, life application study Bible says that Priscilla and Aquila met Paul in Corinth in a second missionary journey. They had just been expelled from Rome by Emperor Claudius mm. in his decree against Jews. Uh, their home was movable as the tents they made to support themselves. They opened up their home to Paul, and he joined them in tent making, and he shared uh, with them their wealth of spiritual wisdom. And then it says this, and this is worth noting as well. Priscilla and Aquila made most of their spiritual education. They listened carefully to the sermons and evaluated what they heard. And when they heard Apollo speak, they were impressed by his ability, but realized that his information was not complete. Mm-hmm. Instead of open confrontation, the couple took uh, Apollos quietly home and shared with him what he needed to know. And until then, Apollos had, had been aware only of John the Baptist's message about Christ. But but Priscilla and Aquila told them about Jesus, life, death, and resurrection, and the reality of God's indwelling spirit. Mm-hmm. So so really, it was uh, you know Apollos who had sort of gone off and was carrying on John the Baptist's message, right. and Aquila and Priscilla had you know had, had you know it's almost like haven't you heard apollos yeah haven't you heard that uh you know it's not just the announcement of the messiah mm-hmm. the messiah says the messiah has come 
Yeah. And so they're the ones, and it says that they didn't do it publicly, they put them aside privately. Yeah, so that happens a little bit later in the story, although it's only just a few verses after the verses we read today. Um, in this time slot is when, you know, it's a year and a half long, the Bible says. Right. Paul stayed there a year and a half during this time. During that time, he wrote the books of uh, First and Second Thessalonians. Uh, he wrote a couple of the other the books during that time. So actually, tomorrow we're pivoting into Thessalonians, right? Right. And then when we come back after we get out of Thessalonians, then we'll read about how um, Priscilla and Aquila discipled Apollos and kind of corrected some of his, his theology. And then later on, we find in Corinthians that Apollos is one of the great leaders. It's Paul, Peter, and Apollos. They're the three famous ones when Paul writes his letter back to Corinth. So so let's let's talk just a little bit about uh, Corinth. <clears throat> um, Corinth was an economic hub. If you know how Greece is designed or built, there's the thick part at the top. It comes down to a very narrow isthmus, and then it widens back out at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And at that very narrow part, the uh, the ancients dug a canal from the... Um, Aegean Sea over to the Adriatic Sea, right? And they dug this thing so that the ships wouldn't have to go all the way around the bottom of Greece. They could just cut right through the middle. So Corinth sits right there on that canal and was Las Vegas times 100. Mm. It was the wildest city in the that entire portion of the Roman Empire. It was off the hook all the time. And then... Uh, it was every kind of debauchery. It's all these sailors coming in and out. Uh, it's the Roman soldiers coming in and out of that town. The people were wild. Uh, and then even the temple worship. So there was a temple to Aphrodite there. And the temple worship was um, uh, uh, with the, you worshiped Aphrodite uh, with the temple prostitutes, the male and female temple hmm. prostitutes is how you worshiped. So wow. it was a crazy city. And so you can imagine, that's why Paul is, you know, he's trying to preach the gospel, but it's pretty intimidating because he's looking around and the world is just great. There's no crazier city he's ever been in than Corinth. And so God has to say in this vision, don't be afraid, speak out, don't be silent for I'm with you and no one will attack you and harm you for many people in the city belong to me. And I think it's important for us as we're kind of surrounded by a pretty crazy world right now. A lot of Christians are afraid to speak up. A lot mm -hmm. of Christians are afraid to declare their faith. They're afraid that they're going to pay some price. And we forget that there are many, many, many people. They might be silent, but there's many people that are on God's side. And so, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we need to encourage one another. The church is so much more important. The darker the world gets, the more important it is that we're connected to a group of Christians that can encourage one, each other, encourage one another that there's lots of people on God's side, on the side of right. Yeah, so everybody would have sailed through that Canal. Oh, yeah. Everybody mm -hmm. would have been to Corinth. It would have been the city that everybody would have had to all the business visited. people. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, you know, it's amazing how um, you know people in New York. I remember one time uh, I, I went to a uh, Passion conference. So I'm going to reference Louis Giglio, oh, uh -huh. uh, who who's a you know part of the Passion movement. And this yeah. was back in the day, and uh, and he, he I remember him coming back, and you know I was a part of his group, and he said. You know, people have told me for decades that you can't have an effective ministry in New York City because New York City is full of people who are just anti-religious and all mm. these different kind of things. And it's X, Y and Z. And, you know, it's just it's not going to happen. And he said, and yet he said, we had this passion conference and we opened it up into this huge arena. And I don't know what it was, 13,000 people. And he said it's sold out faster than any other city. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so it, 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 it reminds me of what you just said. Yeah. So, you know, here's God telling, you know, Corinth you know, or Paul, looking, looking at Corinth, you may be intimidated. Mm -hmm. You may be told that just because of all the people that are here and all of the wickedness and all the debauchery and everything else, that there's no believers here, but they're here. Right. Right. And, and it reminds me of that speech that Louis gave yeah. to our, to us. That's fantastic. I, th I think that, um, so because of this encouragement, he says, okay, well, I'm going to hang in here for a year because he realized then, okay, well, if there are some other believers, let's dig in and let's get a foothold here. So the church in Corinth, um, he winds up later on, he writes a couple of books, several books back to the Corinthians. Um, the, the Bible seems to reference maybe four different letters that he wrote to Corinthians. Some people would say that first Corinthians is two 
and Second Corinthians is two letters. It, mm-hmm. it appears that maybe there's two ch- chunks, uh, or he wrote four separate letters. But he writes back to them, and a lot of times, and for them, they're Christians. But he's saying you're living like the world. So a lot of his letters uh, that he writes to the Corinthians in particular, I think are very, very relevant to us as Christians today. Of all of Paul's letters, it almost feels like the book of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians are written right at our American culture today because he's saying, watch out for living like the world, be careful about sexual purity, uh, you know, put God first, choose to get along, use your spiritual gifts to serve other people. It, he's, he's writing things to them that he doesn't have to write to a lot of, most of the rest of the place he's writing encouragement. But to them, there's one time, a couple different times, he tells them, don't make me come there, <laughs> right? Because they're misbehaving. <laughs> or he says, uh, you know, word has gotten around that every time you guys get together, you're, you're, you're fighting. And I, I believe it because I've been there, right? So they're pretty worldly, and, but he believes in them. And so he decided, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay for a year and a half. And uh, God blesses that ministry. And out of it comes many great leaders. I have a note uh, for verses 10 and 11. It said, you know, because it says many other people became followers of Christ. It mentions, um, uh, who does it mention there? Uh, it mentions Titius Justice. It mentions a couple of other people. But here it mentions people that Paul talks about throughout the rest of the Bible. Phoebe, she's the one who took the 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 book of Romans to, to Rome. Uh, she became a Christian during that time. Yeah, I like Phoebes. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Tertius, Erastus, Cordus. Chloe, that lady, she's mentioned a, a couple different times. Gaius, Stephanus in his household, he mentions him in Corinthians. Uh, Fortunatus, Achaicus. There's several people that Paul winds up going on ministry with. These people serve with him and sharing the gospel in other places. So he wasn't just there struggling and not seeing any fruit. He stayed in a very difficult place, was seeing fruit, and not only was he seeing fruit and people coming to faith in Christ, these people became ministry partners of his that wound up going on. And so don't under, sometimes we overestimate what one conversation or what one speech or one message should accomplish, and we underestimate what can happen in 12 months or 18 months or two years of real intentional discipleship and disciple making. Mm. Yeah. You know, and, and also uh, uh, there, there's a lesson in there. It reminds me that there's power in being in the same community for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you've been in the community that you live in now for how many years? Uh, almost 17 years. It's six, 16 and a half years. Yeah. yeah. So, so I've been in this area for, uh, since 2004. So it would have been 18, it'd been 18 yeah, yeah, years. 18 so pretty, years. Yeah. pretty similar. Yeah. Just like most everything for yeah, us. Right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, but I remember going to, uh, my wife and I went to the uh, supermarket way up. Uh, I mean, it, it was almost 25 minutes away in the opposite direction uh, not even the same county as we're in right now, mm-hmm. and uh, had gone over and we went to a Trader Joe's or something, and I ran into somebody, and this person actually asked me about like, hey, when you go places, do people recognize you? And mm-hmm. and you know, sort of like making it a bigger deal than it is, you know. Sure. And uh, and I and I and I was reminded, and I said, well, actually, it's sort of just the benefit of being around in one community for a long yeah, time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And when you're around, you can make a lasting difference. So it's a great encouragement for all of us. That, you know, you're not going to necessarily, you know, make a difference in somebody's life in a 10 minute conversation. You know, you know if somebody's going through real problems uh, to invest in them, to to meet with them consistently over and over, put your time in. Right. Because when you decide to plant yourself either in a community or in somebody's life or to invest in somebody, you can make a real difference. And, and so Paul staying here is amazing because it just mentions it and it breezes over it. Oh, a year and a half. Yeah. Just like that. Boom. Yeah. One verse. Yeah. But we can't underestimate. We can't even begin to imagine all the time in the ministry that Paul did in that year and a half. It's such such a big thing, and and we we can't under uh, we can't over talk this topic. I don't think um, this is why God gives you your children for as many years as they stay. It used to be eighteen, and now it's I don't know twenty six or thirty <laughs> years that you can stay with you. Um, I feel your pain, yeah. Jeff. <laughs> exactly, uh, but you know it's time. It's faithfulness over time. It's intentionality over time. But it's also being intentional about the words you say. So God said, don't be afraid. Speak out. Don't be silent. So a lot of times what we're hoping is we hope that, you know, my presence around them for for 15 years or 18 years, that presence, it'll rub off. Mm. But it does require that we're not afraid that we do speak up. That we declare things. It's the same thing with our coworkers. Uh, so yes, you should live like a Christian. Hopefully, they'll notice that you're living differently than them. Um, but you should also speak up. 
there needs to be intentionality with the words that you say that you're bringing the message to. Don't be afraid. And then, um, you know, you don't have to be alone. You're, you're not alone in this. The, the Christianity is not a lone ranger sport. It's a team sport. And so God says, so don't be afraid. I'm going to protect you. You're not going to get roughed up in Corinth. Um, mostly because in Corinth, anything goes anyways. It's a pretty right. crazy town. So that's part of it. Um, but he said, uh, there's other Christians. There's other people like you. Many people in this city belong to me. And so this gave him confidence. I'm going to stay for a long period of time, but I am going to speak up. And as a result, many of the key partners of Paul throughout the rest of his ministry, he led to Jesus right there. Mm. And so it wasn't just this vague lifestyle evangelism. There was a direct personal engagement sharing the gospel with actual words. And I, I just want to encourage our, our, our listeners Make sure that you're also learning how to present the gospel, share the gospel, not just live it, but also share it. You know, the best part of that whole thing that you just went through was the fact that you used a cutting edge example of Lone Ranger. Yeah. Yeah. Are you going to reference Gilligan's Island next for all of our cutting edge listeners? Probably. Leave it to Beaver. Yeah. Leave it to the Beverly Beaver. Hillbillies. Green Acres. So I was watching Petticoat Junction the other day. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> the cutting edge, yeah, cutting yeah, edge yeah. example. Uh -huh. Yeah, but but I understand. I don't know if there's a modern day reference yeah. for Lone Ranger. So so you couldn't let that go. I let the fact that you just yawned while I was talking. You I know, let that go. Hey, listen, it's but, this studio. But you had to come after this me with, studio. with the Lone Ranger. To be honest, on this whole episode, you've given me grace because yeah. I messed up twice. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know. So, you know... It, if, if, to whom much is given, much is required, dude. <laughs> that's funny. Mm -hmm. You want me to take my gloves off? Here we go. Uh, no, no. Ex yeah, actually, funny. I think what we need to do is end it's it not before a solo, that happens. It's not a solo climb. It's a team sport. How about yeah, that? yeah, yeah. But, but there's okay, not... Solo just came out. There's not a... Oh, yeah. Last year? That was good. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, that's probably a good place. Yes. To end. It's, it's coming off the rails. We need to quit. We'll, uh, we'll see you tomorrow on the Daily Bible Guys.